Karina Lyons, Vice President and Director of Research at the East West Centre and host of East West Centre Insights. The Centre is a cutting edge research and capacity building institution and we're based right here in Hawaii and our mission is to forge a deeper understanding and connection between the East and the West. So every two weeks here on this show, which is on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. in Hawaii, uh, I'll have a conversation with an East West Centre expert or one of our guests from our global network about critical issues facing the Asia Pacific region. So do check us out uh, on uh, eastwestcenter.org slash insights. I'm super excited about our guest today. Uh, we have Dr. Akimi Glenn, who is the founder and executive director of the Popolo Project, which is a Hawaii-based nonprofit organization, uh, which is redefining what it means to be black in Hawaii and in the world through cultivating reconnection with the self, uh, the community, ancestors, and the land. She's also co-founder of Hawaii Strategy Lab, which is an initiative seeking to democratize data and research. Dr. Glenn is a linguist whose research focuses on Pacific languages, in particular Tokelau, which is quite random and I'm really keen to dig into that. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about blackness, blackness in the Pacific, culture, race and racism. Dr. Glenn, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Aloha. Aloha. Hey, and before we get into it, um, I just wanted to remind those who are joining us live, uh, if you have a question for, uh, for Dr. Glenn, Akimi, if I can call you that, um, please submit your questions uh, via email to shows at thinktechhawaii.com. That's shows at thinktechhawaii.com. And I have to articulate it like that because um, of my Kiwi accent. So, <laughs> So thanks for making the time today. Uh, I know that you've been um, super busy over the last couple of weeks doing all kinds of activities. And um, I wanted to jump straight in because the name of the show is called Blackness in the Pacific. And uh, what is blackness? It's a wonderful question and, and not surprisingly one that we get asked quite often at the Popolo Project. Um, when we talk about blackness, we're talking about a way of categorizing people that does come from Europe. It's a way that um, relies on ideas about the phenotypes of people to make larger statements about their value in the world and their position in the world. And while blackness is historically something that has been used to subjugate people and to make them available for various kinds of extraction, whether the actual extraction of their bodies from their land, their homeland, or um, the extraction of resources from that land uh, to be kind of circulated in the global markets. Um, there are also really interesting pieces of blackness that also foster solidarity across great distance. So whether we're talking about the African diaspora and the concept of blackness uniting us there because of that shared experience of extraction and movement, or we're talking about the connections between Africa and the Pacific, um, under the kind of blanket of blackness, there's a lot of interesting kind of solidarity and learning that happens across those those really vast spaces. Right. So you don't have to be African to be sort of black in this particular construct. Is that what you're saying? Right. That's right. Ah, so how is then blackness uh, talked about in the Pacific? Well, you know, in a lot of places in the Pacific, the concept of blackness came with Europeans entering into the region. So Europeans had lots of experience interacting with black people and people that they kind of categorize as black in the African world and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, eventually in the Americas and the Caribbean. And by the time they came to the Pacific, they had already kind of calcified a lot of ideas about what it meant to be black. So of course the, the phenotype that we're looking for is dark skin and curly hair. And in truth, that's the majority of humans on the planet fall somewhere within the range of blackness. Um, one of the reasons that that was really attractive for folks as, as colonization was spreading around the globe was that it also identified um, more people who could be available for this kind of extraction that I mentioned. So, um, you know, we have history here in the Pacific of, of people who were enslaved and they were people who were identified primarily for that kind of extraction from their own home based on their phenotype. So in, here in the, in the Pacific, a lot of the ideas about blackness were actually developed by Europeans in their interactions with African people. And when they encountered people on the other side of the world who had curly hair and dark skin, they applied those same notions about them that they had kind of constructed in those previous centuries of interaction. Of course, that's why we have places like New Guinea, um, called New Guinea by Europeans because they recognize the connections in the phenotype at least, and in some cultural aspects between the, the inhabitants there, the native people there, and people in Guinea in West Africa as well. 
Ah, <laughs> I um, I just was thinking about um how Pacific people may identify within this construct. I mean, in your research, did you find that people who fit the you know who have those immutable personal characteristics, Melanesians, for example, did they identify um? Uh, within this construct? And if so, then what do they call it? Because uh, as, a, as a daughter of the Pacific, um, at least the term is, is relatively new to me and I and I think of it purely in an American context. So I'd welcome your, your insights there. Sure, well, you know, I think it is important to continually connect this back to Europe's construction of the world. This is not an indigenous Pacific concept, just as it was not an indigenous African concept, this idea of blackness, this kind of, um, you know, this, this, this consuming category that um, gets rid of a lot of our differences, our ethnic and cultural differences, our particular histories, and really boils our, our value as humans and our potential as humans down to our phenotypes and then what those phenotypes say about our particular possible histories. So um, this idea of blackness in the Pacific, I think you're quite right that it's new in some ways in the, in the sense of people here actually subscribing to it themselves. So certainly Europeans impose this as they talked about people in, in the Western part of the Pacific that we call Melanesia, uh, people in Fiji. Um, they use these ideas of their encounters with African people and people of African descent on the other side of the world to inform their interactions with folks in the Pacific. But when we really see people embracing this concept of, of blackness was, part of, uh, was as part of the decolonization movements that we saw in the 20th century. So you have people um, starting to understand that as they're interfacing with colonial regimes like the French, for example, in the Pacific, um, that they have something in common, uh, both in terms of the way that France or the metropolitan power is looking at them um, in similar ways to people in the Caribbean or in Africa who are, who are raced as black and who are of African descent. They see some solidarity there. And so there was a lot of intentional work that was done kind of politically, um, especially in the, in the 20th century, through the middle 20th century into this very moment where people are thinking about small island states in the Caribbean, having things in common with small island states here in the Pacific, and thinking about how um, part of the work of encountering blackness in a political realm is reasserting that humanity that it's been kind of extracted in a way by the imposition of this category on people who are quite diverse, um, even if we're talking about people of African descent. The continent is huge, the diaspora is enormous, but we still have this overarching concept of who these people are and how they behave um, and understanding that, that the Pacific is also painted in some of those brush strokes, I think is what has drawn people into seeing a solidarity of blackness and being able to talk about the specific ways that, that racial identities have been constructed in the Pacific that are not separate. Um, they're different, but connected to some of these ideas that have been developed in Europe and the Atlantic world. Yeah, I mean, that really resonates with me. But I remember the first, um, when I first began working in the Caribbean, uh, as a as a Pacific woman, I, I wasn't really sure what to expect um, because um, uh, I, we were all, you know, for some reason or rather, invested in this in this idea of solidarity. Except that what we found was a lot of differences, uh, historical differences, um, at which uh, were not sort of construed in any kind of a negative way. It was more just you know an opportunity to learn about each other, and that was that was really um, unifying in a sense. Um, but then to, drag, to track back to um, current events um, and um, sort of the, the, um, the American, but also sort of the global um, protests, um, sort of trying to highlight and advocate um, for, um, try to highlight sort of system, systemic injustice. Um, there's been a lot of Pacific peoples uh, showing up in either American cities or where they live in New Zealand and Australia and then Pacific countries, other Pacific countries, aligning themselves to the Black Lives Matters movement. And why do you think that is? Well, I think honestly, first and foremost, um, it's a movement for the recognition of the humanity of Black people. Um, and whether you're identifying as Black or not, I think there's something very compelling about people who just want some control over their, their lives and livelihoods. So I think that that is something that I, I think is very apparent is resonating with people of all sorts and all different backgrounds. I think that's a, a huge part of what's drawing people out. Um, and another part of it, of course, is that um, though we might have very different histories, 
we do have some similar experiences in the experience of colonization. And even though New Zealand, for example, has a, its own particular history as being formerly part of the, the British Empire, a lot of those European ideas about blackness and indigeneity, and often those things together, um, informed the ways that policies and security apparatuses were constructed. And so the reality is that many of us, though, not necessarily having the same perhaps level of violence directed at us or the, the same kind of frequency of violence directed at our own bodies, understand the ways that people who have been colonized are um, kind of consumed by the apparatuses that have been built around the colonization of the places where we live. And even in a place where there wasn't, say, settler colonialism, where there, there wasn't a whole population who came in and displaced Native people, there's still ongoing relationships that have to do with the extraction of resources, um, the way that tourism comes in and, and reorders the society. And it's often the case, uh, especially because of these deep-seated ideas about race and who belongs where and who has the right to kind of assert their own economic interests as well that we see people who are darker skinned and who fit closer to this, this phenotype ideal that I've been talking about. Those are the folks on the bottom and those are the folks who most likely are gonna have to deal with violence within those systems, whether it's at the hands of policing or the military or some other, some other force. So I think when folks are coming out, it's not only because of their own particular self-interest, but also acknowledging the kind of larger questions of humanity, but informed by their own experience in the various places that they've been for the last several centuries. Yeah, it's super interesting and, and explain, um, I, I like what you said there about um, communities that didn't have a massive influx of settlers for, because I was thinking um, when I asked you that question about the sort of hashtag Kongans for Black Lives Matter signs that I saw, you know, I was like trying to work out, you know, would they live in Tonga um, and yet they feel um, really motivated to align themselves and um, here in Hawaii, uh, obviously, uh, oh, sorry, how long have you been here in Hawaii? Been here about 17 years here in Hawaii. Yeah. Okay. Would that make you a local? I don't know. You have to ask locals about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that I'm not a local. That's <laughs> so, what was the, um, so, so, Popolo, the name of your project, that is the Hawaiian word for black. Yeah, is that right? Well, Popolo itself is a plant, um, and it's a plant that lives across the entirety of the Pacific in New Zealand. It's called Poro Poro. Um, it's, it has this name, a uh, very similar name across all of the Pacific. It was a canoe plant. Um, it was brought here by Pacific voyagers to Hawaii and established itself. But it's also a plant that has roots all around the world. It lives in tropical and temperate zones, and it's a nightshade that produces little black berries. So, um, the, the association of this plant with Black people, uh, we believe probably has been around for some time, but was kind of a slang, kind of euphemistic reference. Um, we see more of it coming after World War II when there was more sustained presence by people of African descent in larger numbers during the war. The, the war. Um, and uh, depending on who you talk to, it's, it's either a word that people embrace or it's something pejorative. But the reason that my organization has decided to use this and lean into it is because of its longstanding history in the Pacific. And the fact that not only was this plant something that was valuable enough that voyagers took it with them. Um, when it was established, it was a plant that was used for medicine. It has antibacterial properties supposedly and, and was used traditionally to help with breathing, um, any kind of breathing complaints. And so we are interested in thinking about the medicine in Popolo and thinking about the relationship between um, a native Hawaiian, a Pacific word, and the, the way that it points to blackness and the way that it points to the contributions of black people. And um, the fact that though this is a plant from elsewhere, it has a home here and it has a valuable home and valuable contribution to make. Thanks, Akimi. I love that. That's something really spiritual and lyrical about all of that. And we are about to go to a break. And then when we come back, I'm going to ask you about um, being Black in Hawaii and what that's like. Aloha, I'm Lillian Kumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha. <laughs> 
Maloney and welcome back to East West Inner Insights. Um, I'm here today talking to Dr. Akimi Glenn about uh, blackness in the Pacific. And uh, just before the break, I gave her a fair warning that I was going to ask her about being black in Hawaii. So Akimi, what's that like? Well, that's a big question. Of course, <laughs> my experience is just one of, of very many. Um, our community here is a small one. Um, we're between two and three and a half or four percent of the total population here in Hawaii, which means about 20,000 people, give or take, across the entirety of the state. Most of us are here on Oahu, um, the most populous island, of course. Um, but there's been kind of a, a growth in our community in the last several years. I'm really curious to see the, the current census ongoing, uh, what, what our numbers are going to look like. I think there's been an influx of people moving here, especially from North America in recent years. Um, you know, frankly, being Black in Hawaii is very different. Um, being Black anywhere is, is a specific experience. So um, certainly in my experience, I've, I was lucky and have been lucky to live and travel across the Pacific and, and as a younger person lived around the world and moved to Hawaii from New York City. So certainly being Black in Honolulu is very different from being Black in New York City, where there is a very vibrant and rich and diverse kind of representation of African diaspora culture for sure. I think one of the, the challenges and one of the interesting things about being black here is because of our small numbers, a lot of folks encounter us mostly through the media and through entertainment and um, their ideas about black people and what we do and what we're into and our culture come through those kinds of mass media representations. And so part of our work in the Popolo Project is also to give our larger community some alternative visions of what our lives are like and who we are, who we're connected to and the work that we do. Yeah, I, um, I also moved to Hawaii from New York City, uh, and um, I'm not black. Uh, and uh, I don't even really identify as a person of color because that is a sort of, that's more of an American framing. Um, I would identify as, as um, a woman, a, a Samoan New Zealander. But um, my team looked up the stats, and apparently Hawaii is about roughly three quarters, 75% uh, made up of people who identify as, some, like, as a person of color. Um, and I was interested in, um, you know, the experience of the black community relative to, um, to, to, to that community. Um, and then also your views on the state of race relations here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking that because um, Hawaii is, all, is often held up as this um, paradise. And there was a, a recent New York Times article that said, if you want to be less racist, move to Hawaii. And uh, I would welcome your, your views and comments on all of that. Yeah, um, I think Hawaii is certainly represented as a, as a racial utopia and a melting pot. And I think there are some wonderfully beautiful pieces of the local culture that have been about you know, intercultural interactions and the creation of a new culture that we even call local. Um, but all of that, of course, has been done in the context of um, the particular history of Hawaii. Um, Hawaii only recently becoming part of the United States, the overthrow of the, the government here by um, business interests in the 1890s. All of that is not only part of Hawaii's history, but part of American history. And certainly the overthrow itself was, was very much influenced and fertilized and, and encouraged by white supremacist interests. Um, just yesterday or a couple days ago, there was a, a conversation on Twitter uh, with some Black Pacific scholars and folks were talking about um, the fact that there was a Ku Klux Klan chapter in Fiji in you know, not too long ago, and a lot of people don't know that, there was likewise a Ku Klux Klan chapter here in Honolulu. Um, so these are pieces of Hawaii's kind of hidden history that are just under the surface and have shaped our, our current race relations. And I think one of the things that's really important in understanding how people conceptualize Hawaii as a, as a kind of racial melting pot, it's in dark and stark contrast to the United States. Um, so that idea of Hawaii being this kind of peaceful utopia with all these different kinds of people living happily together is a foil to what has been happening in the United States for its entire history. But certainly we see these, these, these opportunities to point to Hawaii as an exemplar really pop up when there is uh, undeniable racial unrest. Um, we've seen it in the last couple of weeks with people kind of saying, well, you know, we don't have these problems in Hawaii. We do, um, they just look a little bit different because we have a kind of different community composition here. Um, mm -hmm. There certainly there certainly is violence. Um, there's certainly police involved deaths here. 
but it's not the same uh, the same uh, communities that are directly impacted. So that New York Times article last year, um, I was one of the people that was interviewed for that discussion and got to talk with the, the writer of that article who was very interested, not so much in the experience of us, our community on the day-to-day, -day, but looking at some research that was coming out of UH Manoa, uh, uh, looking at perceptions by white people of people of color, to use that category here in Hawaii. And what they found was because of the composition of the community here, some of the racialized ideas that people have in North America didn't have a clear analog when folks showed up in Hawaii. So it was mostly looking at transplants and their attitudes and this New York Times science writer was really curious about that and wondering, um, coming from New York himself and, and a place that is um, certainly very racialized and has a history of segregation and, and violence and all of those things connected to race, he was interested in looking for a place that, um, that doesn't have that. His conclusion, of course, was that having mixed race people uh, be almost 25% of the community here. Uh, his idea was that mixed race people were actually solving the problem of race in Hawaii. And it was this idea of having people who had diverse genealogies in one place that kind of interrupted the ideas that white people would have about racializing or categorizing people in certain uh, racialized ways that would inform policy and structures of society. Um, but you know where I take where I took and still take some issue with that conclusion is that um, the United States is also a history of mixed race people and diverse genealogies and communities, and in my own family, which which you did mention in that article, um, my ancestors are from from Africa certainly, but also from the UK, um, from southern China, and also indigenous American people. Um, but both of my parents were considered black because of the way that the racialization works in North America. It just simply doesn't work the same way in Hawaii or in the Pacific. Even though we do have this category of blackness, the ways that people get assigned to it are different. Yeah. Uh, no, that that explains a lot because I'm fine. I don't ascribe to to any of those um, terms, and I and I'm a mixed race. But I am. Um, I'm still just trying to get over the fact that you uh, told us about a KKK. <laughs> our um, alcove here and in Fiji. I'm, I'm pretty shocked by that, but um, but perhaps more interested in um, uh, your point about Hawaii being used as a foil when compared to the U.S. and then sort of the, you know and then its description of the utopia, utopia relative to other places where the, where racial relations aren't quite as harmonious. But that doesn't detract us, I think, from the from the issues that are here. Um, and uh, when I first a arrived, um, uh, just a few years ago now, um, uh, I, I mean, I've never really experienced any overt racism as a Samoan person, but I was told a lot anecdotally uh, that there is overt racism against the Micronesian community here, and I was interested in your views on that. Certainly, um, that's something that's impossible to look away from. And I think for, for someone like myself, coming from an experience of being racialized as Black in North America and under kind of an American understanding of what race means and the consequences, um, there are a lot of things that are happening in the Micronesian community and to the Micronesian community that are in parallel to the ways that Black people have been racialized. Um, ideas around criminality, over-policing, um, violence at the hands of police, even vigilante violence. Uh, one of the stories that I often try to bring up and remind people of here in Hawaii is just recently, a 16 year old boy named Starsky Willie was killed by a neighbor in Kalihi Valley, suspected of being a, um, involved in a burglary. And that story and the way that it was covered in our local news media was almost, I mean, it was out of the kind of Black Lives Matter playbook because it draw it drew on these ideas of this teen just kind of by virtue of the kind of boy he was the fact that he was chukis the fact that he was living in public housing all of those things pointed to the possibility of his criminality even though there was no evidence that this this young child was involved in any criminal behavior even the way that his his photos were represented in the news media there were some photos where his skin had been darkened um, or where the contrast had been played with a bit, or he was he was um, shown in a hoodie, or he was shown looking very defiant. These are all kinds of visual representations of blackness, and especially the association between blackness and criminality 
that get applied to, um, to Micronesian people. There's a wonderful news, uh, not news, but a, a legal ar article written in the Hawaii Law Review several years ago by um, Professor Charles Lawrence, who's now retired from Richardson School of Law, where he talks about local kind implicit bias and he makes direct parallels between the ways that Micronesian people are um, talked about in popular culture here in Hawaii and especially in the law including uh, ways that people have been given harsher sentences than others who've committed similar crimes. And at sentencing, the judge has mentioned, I'm giving you this extra penalty because you're Micronesian and the rest of your community needs to be taught a lesson. So we do have evidence of that. And often when people um, talk about some of the outrages that the Micronesian community has been subjected to in these ways, they say, well, they're the newest immigrants here, and every new immigrant group has to kind of, you know, take their lumps until they get integrated into the society. But the reality is um, that's not the case necessarily. And when we look at other small immigrant groups, Micronesians are about 2% of the population as well. They're a very small group of people in terms of numbers. Um, we have the same kinds of patterns that you see with Black people on the continent and in other places, um, the levels of incarceration, over-policing, but also just general attitudes about their worth, um, their contribution to society, um, even so far that, that there are some people in certain public spaces who hide their Micronesian identity so that they are able to be afforded more respect or care in dealing with coworkers or other people in the community. So there, there are a lot of parallels, both culturally and structurally in the ways that those folks have been treated. At the same time, uh, a lot of people who are here because of the Compacts Free Association have come here for education, for healthcare services, for a better life, just like everyone else. And those stories are often not shared. Uh, what we most likely hear in the, in the public kind of discourse about Micronesians here is that exact kind of racialization where it's focused on the criminality, the strangeness of their culture, their foreignness, and their, their um, kind of the ways that they're at odds with what we think of as local and what we think belongs here in Hawaii. Thank you, Akimi. Extremely important points, um, intrinsically valuable in and of themselves, but also on the on the cusp of the um, the negotiation of the compacts again between the U.S. and then Palau and the Federated States of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. Uh, I have run over time, and um, I'm going to have to get you on again because I didn't get to ask you about Tokelau. So we're going to have to definitely do this again. Thank you so much for your time today and uh, for sharing your, your views so freely with us. And, um, and then if you're watching and you have any questions, please follow up and we'll get Dr. Glenn on the show. You've been watching East West Center Insights. Uh, thank you very much for spending your afternoon with us. Aloha.